So, hello everyone, and welcome for the webinar for the launch of the fourth edition of the IA's Global Hydrogen Review. I would just like to remind you that this webinar is being recorded. And first of all, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when you are joining us from. My name is Amalia Pizarro. I am an energy analyst at the International Energy Agency, and I am one of the authors of this Global Hydrogen Review. And I'm joined here by Uwe Reme, who is head of the Hydrogen and Alternative Fuels Units, and Jose Bermudez, uh, both are lead authors and coordinators of this report. This new edition of the Global Hydrogen Review, which was already first published in 2021, was officially presented yesterday at the 15th Clean Energy Ministerial Meeting in Fox de Guazú in Brazil, and you can find the full report on the IA website. The Global Hydrogen Review is an outcome of the Clean Energy Ministerial Hydrogen Initiative, which is supported by more than 20 governments around the world. And first, we would like to take this opportunity to thank to all the government representatives of the initiatives for their valuable feedback and policy updates, and in general, to all the reviewers and institutions who have provided very valuable comments and insights throughout the analysis of the report. And the Global Hydrogen Review, uh, the fourth edition, uh, trusts key developments on low emissions hydrogen production, demand, infrastructure, trade, policy, investments, and innovation. These themes are covered in the fourth edition and are updated annually, but this year edition has two special focus chapters. One of these special focus chapters is on the greenhouse gas emissions associated to the different hydrogen supply chains. And then we have another special focus chapter on Latin America and the Caribbean. And this special focus chapter is a follow-up of the of a publication of the agency uh, that we did last year, that is the Latin American Energy Outlook. This regional deep, deep dive takes a closer look into the near term opportunities for low emissions hydrogen projects in the region, as well as the challenge associated to achieve its effective deployment. And besides this main report that was released yesterday, all this tracking effort is backed by comprehensive database. And we also released two of these database. We have a low emission hydrogen production projects database that tracks all or almost all uh, low emissions hydrogen projects around the world. Last year, we also released an updated version of this database that now has more than 2,400 projects. And in addition to hydrogen production projects, we also have a database that tracks infrastructure that is so much needed to enable the scale up of low emissions hydrogens and to enable the connection between production and demand. Uh, this database contains information about hydrogen pipelines, underground storage facilities, and import and export terminals at ports. And these two databases are now available also at our website. And with that, and to provide you a more detailed overview of the main findings of the report, I will hand it over to Uwe and Jose. But uh, I would like to remind you that you can make us questions using the Q&A function in Zoom. Please feel free to send them at any point during the presentation, and at the end, we will gather them. Uh, and with that, Uwe, over to you. Um, thank you very much, Amalia, and also welcome to everyone from my side. And uh, I will directly drive into, dive into some of the key findings from this year's uh, report, and would like to start with some positive news, which is um, about the product pipeline for low emission hydrogen production. When we released the, uh, the Global Hydrogen Review uh, 2023 uh, last year, um, the amount of projects um, that have reached a final investment decision stood in terms of production at 1.7 million tons. Over the last 12 months, we've actually seen acceleration of um, FIDs. So the production of these projects has actually doubled now to 3.4 million tons, uh, which could corresponds to a fivefold increase 
of the production for low emission hydrogen that we have today. So increase of five, factor five between today and um, and the product pipeline of projects that have reached um, FID. But the actual amount of uh, projects have been announced is much larger. So the projects that have reached FID account for 7% of the total product, potential production uh, from announced projects. However, if you look at the uh, maturity of these projects, uh, almost half of these projects are very early stages of development, which means um, that it's highly uncertain whether all of these projects can be realized um, by 2030. Um, for the full project pipeline to materialize, actually, the sector has to grow at an annual, um, at a compound annual um, growth rate of uh, more than 90% between today and 2030, uh, which is well above the growth rate that we've experienced, that SolarPD has experienced during its fastest um, period um, of growth for expansion. Um, so it's a quite ambitious um, uh, target if or target if all these projects um, to be still to be realized by, by 2030. Um, moreover, if you look at the sector, not all the news are, are good news. Uh, when you look at the hydrogen or the development of the development of the hydrogen project pipeline, um, several projects have been delayed. We also saw even some cancellation of projects, which of course is putting at risk um, part of the project pipeline um, that has been announced so far. Um, underlying reasons for, for these delays in cancellations are anti demand signals. Also, finance, financing challenges or hurdles. There have been also delays in government funding being provided to projects. Um, there have been or are still existing regulatory uncertainties um, in some countries, and also permitting issues which are delaying um, fund investment decisions of projects um, to move forward. Uh, by looking at the technology split um, of these announced projects, uh, we can see that electrolyzers account for three quarters of the product pipeline and um, CCUS projects for around um, one quarter. If one just looks at the technology split for projects that reach FID on the left side, there we can see that the technology split is, is more even between electrolyzers and CCUS. This suggests that um, CCUS projects or non-CCUS projects are more mature. And um, actually, if we just look at a handful of um, FIDs for CCS projects that have been observed over the past uh, year. These actually would match in terms of production 50 electrolyzer projects that have reached FID in the same period. So again, one sees also that the scale of these projects of CCS are much larger than um, for electrolyzers. If we have a closer look at um, the developments when it comes to FIDs of projects, um, so at the time we published the Global Hydro Review in 2022, there the electrolyzer capacity that's reached FID stood at, stood at around six gigawatts. Um, in the 12 months that led to the um, Global Hydro Review 2023, actually there we've seen a further addition of FIDs of, six, of seven gigawatts um, until September 2023. And, um, as you can see, majority of these projects, FIDs, are linked um, to China, but we also see significant developments or contributions um, in the Middle East, which is linked to the Neon Green Hydrogen project um, of 2.2 gigawatts. And that project actually is today the largest project that has reached um, financial closure. And if you look at the developments of the past three months, um, up to um, September this year, we see that a further uh, 6.5 gigawatt of electrolyzer capacity um, has reached um, FID. Um, there we see again a strong contribution um, from China, building on their experience also in man mass manufacturing clean energy technologies. But we also see a contribution, a significant contribution from Europe, where actually FID is quadrupled over, over the past year. And we also see that India is emerging among the key players in um, electrolyzer project that is linked to a single 1.3 1 gigawatt project, um, which is actually the second largest uh, project that's reached uh, financial closure <coughs> over the um, so far. If one looks at the um, total electrolyzer capacity that has reached FID, so there we stand today at um, 20 gigawatts, around half of this capacity is um, located in China. 
And um, as I mentioned before, China is building on its experience in mass manufacturing, clean technologies, and the country is also today home of 60% of global manufacturing capacity uh, for electrolyzers. And um, China's continued expansion of manufacturing capacity is expected also to drive down costs for electrolyzers further. So very similar to what we've experienced um, before with, uh, with solar PV and batteries. And we also see that Chinese manufacturers are building on the experience um, they have gained from mass manufacturing um, these technologies. And so actually um, solar, several solar PV manufacturers have entered the business of electrolyzer manufacturing so that today one third of the electrolyzer manufacturing capacity in China, which is around 25 gigawatts, is actually linked to um, solar PV manufacturers. In the case of CCUS, uh, we've also seen quite some acceleration of FIDs over the past um, two years. So when we released the Global Hydrogen Review in 2022, there was actually just one project in the United States that has reached FID with an um, estimated production of below 0 0.1 million tons of hydrogen. Over the past two years, we've seen that 14 more projects have reached um, FID, which could produce uh, combined around uh, 1.5 million tons um, of hydrogen. And um, if we, and most of these projects are, as you see on the right figure, are located in North, um, North America, which accounts for three quarters of this potential production from CCS projects. And the region of North America is also building on the experience in developing large scale oil and gas projects, um, which of course are closely linked to some aspects of CCS projects like um, CO2 transport and storage. Of course, the supply of hydrogen or the production of hydrogen is just one, uh, one side of the coin. The other one is demand. And here, despite some progress that we've um, seen over the past months, um, the picture there is less <coughs> positive. Coming to the progress, we've seen actually that um, policy efforts um, are gaining to stimulate demand for low emission hydrogen, hydrogen-based fuels are actually um, gaining traction. So governments have started to implement um, key policies. So we see, for example, in Germany, the carbon contract of differences, or in the EU, the mandates in aviation and um, shipping. And uh, we estimate that uh, based on these implemented policies, as you can see in the figure, um, the demand for low emission hydrogen could reach 60 million tons um, by 2030. And um, if you also take into account um, demand targets put forward by governments, this amount could increase to 11 million tons, which are mainly linked, as you can see in the graph, to, refiner to, re to refineries, the industry sector, and also the transport sector. However, most of these projects, um, or the low emission hydrogen production, most of these targets are not still backed by uh, concrete policies. And I also have to say that these 11 million tons, actually 3 million tons um, lower than the targets that were identified um, last year. So there have been downward revisions, particularly when it comes to transport industry and also power generation. Yet the amount of low emission hydrogen um, production that has taken FID is actually um, significant um, lower at 4 million tons um, in 2030. So it's definitely lower than the demand targets um, that we see. And um, this gap between the demand targets and the committed projects um, can actually see, be seen as a call for action for governments, but also industry um, to facilitate offtake and also um, unlock investments on the supply side. At the same time, if we look at the demand targets of 11 million tons and compare them with the uh, production targets put forward by governments, we can see that the government targets um, add up to around 43 million tons of hydrogen uh, demand uh, production in 2030. And actually, if you also look at the production uh, product, product pipeline of um, low emission hydrogen projects, that is even larger or higher at 40 million tons of hydrogen. So we see a clear gap between uh, the demand, uh, demand targets on the one hand and the production target or the production pipeline for low emission hydrogen. So it means that policy, policy measures that have been implemented so far are still insufficient to, um, to reach the, uh, to scale up the demand levels 
that are needed to meet at the same time also the production um, targets that governments have taken. In addition, we also see that some more ambitious policies have been proposed, for example, the um, industry targets in the European Union. And um, these targets or policies have not been um, yet translated into national legislation. And uh, so there exists some uncertainty how these, um, how these policies will be implemented in the end. So overall, we can say that stronger government action is, is needed to stimulate the demand for low emission hydrogen to um, as an essential requirement also for projects on the supply side um, to, uh, to move forward and um, underpin the investments for these production projects. Looking at, um, or coming back to some positive developments that we are seeing actually based on the implemented policies um, so far, we can see um, that um, industry has taken action by either signing off take agreements or also launching tenders for low emission hydrogen. Um, so if you look at off-take agreements, um, we see that uh, basically in 2020, um, there were basically zero, um, zero off-take agreements um, signed. Uh, if you look at 2023, actually this has increased to 2.5 million tons of um, hydrogen. And if one looks at the cumulative off-take agreements signed so far, this amount adds up to 5 million tons of hydrogen. When looking in more detail um, at these offtake agreements, we can see that the largest um, share of offtake agreements is linked to hydrogen trade projects with an undisclosed um, final uh, final use. So that's um, here in here in pink, um, the other unknown um, category. And uh, also, but has to say that uh, many of these, almost all of these agreements, are still at very early stage and are non-binding, are non-firm agreements. If one uh, looks, the second largest um, contribution in offtake agreements actually comes from existing users. So here we talk about um, the refinery sector and also the chemical sector. And we also see since 2022 that also offtake agreements are being signed in uh, new applications of hydrogen that are uh, close to getting to reaching commercial um, uh, commercial um, maturity. And here we talk, for example, about the shipping sector, also power generation. However, not all of these um, off-tech agreements are done deals um, today. Actually, um, the share of um, agreements that have reached, um, that, are, that are firm, actually stands below, today is below 30%. Uh, but we see quite some significant differences um, between sectors. Um, so we see here in the right figure that the highest share of firm agreements can be found in the shipping sector, but also at the same time, the volumes of um, these agreements are relatively small. Um, the second largest um, share of contribution comes from refining and chemicals, so existing applications. There, um, the share is the share of firm agreements is um, somewhat lower compared to shipping, but at the same time, the volumes that are covered under these agreements is much, large, much larger. This indicates um, that these three sectors um, could be very well placed um, to scale up a low emission hydrogen demand um, in the near term. We also see that um, agreements have been signed in other sectors, particularly also in steel and uh, power generation. Uh, but these uh, agreements are also um, less firm at the moment and also much more geographically or regionally concentrated. One can see that most of the agreements signed um, in the steel sector um, occurred in Europe, while if one looks at the agreements for the power sector, these are very much concentrated um, in Asia in particular. Um, in uh, Japan and Korea. Um, having said that, I will hand it over to my colleague, um, Jose. Thank you very much, Uwe. And continuing with the presentation, we are going to jump now into the topic of the cost of the production of low emission hydrogen, which uh, today still remains as the most important barrier to its adoption. Um, closing the gap between uh, low emission hydrogen production and unabated, unabated fossil based production is of primary importance for the development of functioning markets. However, low emission hydrogen production is an emerging sector, and as such, there is uncertainty about the costs and the future evolution. This year, for example, we have uh, revised upwards uh, the current cost of installing electrolyzers by 20% based on newly available data from more advanced projects. 
Um, the future cost evolution will depend on numerous factors, uh, including technology development, but particularly the level and the pace of deployment. With a level of deployment uh, similar to the one that could be achieved with the current uh, committed electrolyzer projects and also with the implemented policies, we estimate that the cost of low emission hydrogen production from renewable electricity could fall by around 30% from today's values by 2030. Considering the full deployment of the entire uh, project and project pipeline or pipeline of announced projects, uh, which accounts for more than 500 gigawatts, the cost could drop in line with uh, the IEA's net zero emissions by 2050 scenario, uh, in which the cost of renewable hydrogen falls uh, to half of today's value by 2030, with the cost gap between unabated fossil based generation and renewable hydrogen shrinking from $1.5 to $8 dollars today down to $1 to $3 dollars per kilogram by 2030. Uh, this cost production will, of course, benefit all the projects, but the impact uh, on the competitiveness of individual projects will vary. For example, in China, such a level of global deployment would mean that most of the production from its current electrolyzer project pipeline would be cheaper than hydrogen produced from unabated coal. Globally, by 2030, we estimate that more than 5 million tons of low emission hydrogen could be produced at costs that will be competitive with production from unabated fossil base, uh, from unabated fossil fuels. And up to 12 million tons with a cost premium of just $1.5 per kilogram. Um, this cost premium will, of course, uh, remain a challenge in the short term from project developers. But for those final products that will use uh, uh, hydrogen as an intermediate feedstock, the impact could be manageable in many cases. This cost premium of low emission hydrogen production decreases along the value chain, meaning that final consumers often see only modest price increases on the final products. For example, producing hydrogen from, from renewable hydrogen in Europe today is more than twice more expensive than producing it from unabated fossil fuels. When using this renewable hydrogen in the production of steel, this leads to a cost premium in the steel produced of about 40%. While a significant reduction, this is still a significant cost premium for a sector that is very competitive and that operates with many small margins. If we move further down the supply chain, we can see that using this steel pr produced with low emission hydrogen in the manufacture of electric vehicles will mean that the cost of uh, manufacturing an electric vehicle will have a cost premium of just 1%. This can have a knock-on effect on the uh, supply chain because um, uh, users or buyers of these uh, electric vehicles will be willing, uh, will likely be willing to absorb this small premium, thus unlocking a, ma a market for uh, low emissions steel, which can trigger demand for low emission hydrogen. A similar example can be seen in the case of flight tickets. Meeting the mandates of the Refueling EU Aviation Regulation, which requires companies to blend 1.2% uh, uh, of synthetic kerosene in, synthetic, in aviation fuels by 2030, will lead to a small premium of around 2% in the price of a flight ticket. Despite synthetic kerosene being four to five times more expensive than conventional uh, kerosene. This small premium can <clears throat> relatively easy to be absorbed by clients, in particularly those flying in business class or large corporations that have already taken action to offset emissions. <clears throat> As my colleague Amancia mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, this year the Global High End Review includes a special focus on Latin America and the Caribbean. This region is very well placed to produce low emission hydrogen its derivatives building on its abundant renewable energy sources, but also in its largely decarbonized electricity mix. In addition, Latin America has already substantial domestic demand, accounting for around 4% of global demand, and has built relationships with several of the potential major importance of hydrogen and hydrogen-based fuels. The combination of all these factors opens an opportunity, and so, Many stakeholders have announced ambitious plans for developing projects in the region. 
Based on announced projects, by 2030, Latin America could produce more than 7 million tons of hydrogen, with the vast majority having a carbon intensity under 3 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen produced, which is lower than the majority of the announced regulations in other regions of the world. Chile accounts for around half of this production, with projects concentrated in the regions of Magallanes and Antofagasta, and Brazil follows with another 30% of the project pipeline, with a high concentration of projects in the regions of Ceará and Piauí. Other countries with large projects announced include Argentina, Colombia, Mexico and Panama. When, look it, when looking at the size of the announced projects, the high concentration of projects with a capacity over one gigawatt is striking since they account for 85% of all announced projects. On the contrary, the projects with a capacity under 100 megawatts represent only 3% of the total project pipeline. The fact that most of the projects in operation or that have taken a final investment decision in the region have a capacity under 5 megawatts with only a couple of examples uh, of exceptions reaching up to 50 megawatts have led to doubts uh, about the achievability of the hydrogen announcements in the region. This can also be observed on the status of the announced projects, with less uh, than 0.2% having reached a final investment decision, compared with a 7% share globally. Around half of the announcements are at still at feasibility study, and another half are at very early stages of development. Low emission hydrogen offers numerous opportunities to, for Latin America, but they come with challenges associated that the stakeholders uh, will need to carefully address, address to develop progress plans. The region has a massive renewable energy potential with more than 60% of its electricity coming from renewable sources, but this generation is dominated by hydropower. Solar PV and wind represent just 15% of the generation. The real potential of the region remains largely unexploited and hydrogen can help unlocking it. However, the cost of capital in the region for renewable energy projects is very high. For example, cost of capital for solar PV in Mexico and Brazil was around 10 to 12 percent 10, 10 uh, in 2022, compared to just 4 to 5 percent in countries like uh, Germany and the Netherlands. This could sweep away the potential of the region to produce low emission hydrogen at competitive costs. As we have already mentioned, there is a large pipeline of announced projects which could lead to the production of 7 million tons by 2030. However, this will require to increase the renewable and electricity generation to an equivalent of 20% of today's region total power output and will also require substantial investments in enabling infrastructure, such as transmission lines. Most of the regional demand today is met with unabated natural gas, uh, which presents a challenge for a region that is a net importer of natural gas. In addition, in addition, the region is also a large importer of fertilizers, which led to a trade deficit of uh, more than 9 uh, billion US dollars uh, in 2022. Therefore, switching today's production to renewable hydrogen can reduce import dependency and also improve the trade balance. However, when we evaluate today's policy settings and goals, we realize that there is a strong focus on exports and there is a lack of a vision for implementing measures that can stimulate domestic markets for low emission hydrogen and hydrogen based products and fuels. As we mentioned, Latin America has a strong potential to produce low emission hydrogen at competitive price, and this has attracted a lot of interest from potential importers, which opens a large export opportunity for these fuels, as well as materials that can be produced with low emission hydrogen, such as hot briquetted iron, which allow countries uh, that today are large exporters of iron ore, such as Brazil, to develop new industrial capacities and move up in the value chain. However, realizing this potential, uh, this export potential, hinges on the achievement of climate targets in other parts of the world, more than on the actions that governments and industry in the region can put in place. I would like to finish with a brief explanation of the recommendations that we have outlined in the report. 
Governments should take bolder action to stimulate demand for low emission hydrogen through the implementation of policies uh, such as quotas, mandates, and carbon contracts for difference. Industrial hubs, where low emission hydrogen could replace unabated fossil based hydrogen demand today, and public procurement to encourage the development of premium markets remain important and tapped opportunities by governments. Governments should provide targeted support to project developers in the scale up phase to bridge the cost gap between low emission hydrogen and fossil based hydrogen production. Timely support is critical to un unlock investment uh, decisions, as we have seen in Europe in the last year, with a wave of final investment decisions after the confirmation of funding for several large projects. Governments should strengthen regulation and certification of environmental attributes for low emissions hydrogen. The International Organization for Standardization has released this year a methodology that provides a standardized approach to assess greenhouse gas emissions in hydrogen supply chains. But now it's time for governments to implement real regulations that set thresholds for acceptable emissions levels in hydrogen production. In addition, governments should intensify efforts to assess and verify upstream emissions from fossil supply, from fossil fuel supply, ensuring transparency through making this data accessible to market participants and the public. Governments should also strengthen efforts to accelerate the development of hydrogen infrastructure so they can avoid further delays that risk slowing the scale up of low emission hydrogen production and use. Without timely infrastructure deployment, the link between supply and demand cannot be established, hindering market growth and creating uncertainty for both producers and consumers. Finally, advanced economies and multilateral development banks should provide targeted support to emerging markets and developing economies for expanding low emissions hydrogen production and use. These countries hold a significant potential for low cost and low emission hydrogen production, but they face key challenges such as access to financing. Developing these projects can help these countries to reduce import dependence, but also open, uh, potentially open a window of opportunity to export hydrogen and hydrogen based products. And with that, I hand it back to Amalia for the Q&A session. Thank you, Uwe and Jose, for the valuable insights. Uh, I would like to remind to the audience that you can use the Q&A function for submitting us questions. We will take a short break just for two, three minutes to gather some of the questions you have made to us, and we will return and we will address some of them, but please keep on using the Q&A function.
So thank you for waiting for us. We will address some of these questions. We will not have enough time to probably go through all of them, but please feel free to contact us. We'll keep on writing your questions in the Q&A session and we will address some of them afterwards. And I would just like to say to everyone that this webinar uh, will be available, the recording will be available so that you can share it. And I would like to start by making a question to Uwe. Uh, the report says that uh, we should achieve uh, a 90% compound uh, annual growth rate uh, according to the announced project. Uh, what is needed to bridge the gap between what we can see that projects are under construction and FID and the projects that have been announced? Um, yeah, maybe to clarify also that, of course, the, the 90 percent that we presented here is a kind of the growth rate that would be needed to reach or to, to implement all the projects that have been announced is, of course, really just um, to, to illustrate also how challenging or uh, questioning also whether we would actually can achieve the full project pipeline has been announced so far, which of course has have targets for 20, saying that they will be implemented by 2030. But um, I guess one really has to look at um, the current steps of these projects. Um, so we, as I mentioned, how almost all these projects are at very early stages. So it's quite questionable whether in the remaining five years until or five and a half years until 2030 these projects can be realized. So if one looks at the other half, so basically around 20, um, 25 million tons of low emission hydrogen production, so projects that have reached at least um, feasibility study, these projects have to reach, let's say, in the next two years FID plus three year construction time. If one takes, let's say, construction time anticipated for the NEON project. Um, so it gives already some indication what is still feasible in terms of implementing um, projects um, from from the project pipeline. Um, it's difficult to say what would be, let's say, the right growth rate. Of course, at the same time, as we also mentioned um, in the presentation, um, we still see also um, lacks, uh, lack of further action needed um, from the government side to close the cost gap, but also to create demand. This, of course, or some uncertainties when it comes to regulations, which is of course also delaying uh, final investment decisions of projects. Um, so I guess it's a mixture of things, what is kind of technically feasible to implement by 2030, and also um, what is going to happen further, whether we see further progress also on the on the policy side um, that allow to unlock some of these projects to move forward. And now I have a question for Jose. Uh, the Global Hydrogen Review shows that the cost of low emissions hydrogen is quite high. Is this the reason that is preventing demand projects to happen? Or what could be preventing uh, more projects on the demand side? So, I mean, yes, the main barrier remains still uh, the high cost of production. That's, that's clear. Uh, but uh, there are many other barriers that we have identified that are preventing projects to go ahead and to materialize both on the demand and the, and the supply side. Um, some examples are, for example, permitting issues. This is delaying a lot uh, projects that are waiting sometimes for access connections, for the infrastructure uh, to be developed, which is another challenge, the lack of the infrastructure that can link production on demand. So traditionally, hydrogen production and use has been collocated. Now we are we, we see an opportunity to move into the collocation of production and use, We're looking for the best opportunities to produce low emission hydrogen at a lower cost, and that will require um, the development of, of infrastructure, but also regulatory issues. For example, we are just now start to see some governments to implement regulations on, on how to define uh, low emission hydrogen, clean hydrogen, the different definitions, and what this mean in terms of accessing to um, uh, project support. So there are many other barriers, <clears throat> apart what, what is the cost. And within that, uh, governments need to take a holistic view of all the policy instruments that they have. But this does not mean only to provide uh, economic support to projects. This is just one of the options that they have. They have many other options uh, through regulatory uh, uh, mandates and, and quotas for creating demand um, or for things like um, uh, uh, policies that can decrease the, the risk that investors are seeing today in projects. Decreasing this risk will mean decreasing the cost of capital, which is one of the main components of the cost of producing low emission hydrogen today. 
and that will be transformed into lower costs that will help in unlocking demands and also unlocking projects on the supply side. Thank you, Jose. There was also a question about the logistic costs related to hydrogen and hydrogen-based products, such as conditioning, handling, transport, and storage. So the report also has a full section on infrastructure where we provide detailed assessments on the costs and on the tracking of progress of hydrogen pipelines, hydrogen blending projects, hydrogen underground storage facilities and terminals. All that information is available in the report. And also additionally, we have an annex that we have just published that so you could actually check the assumptions we have regarding the techno-economic cost of this infrastructure and how much it will cost to transport hydrogen by pipeline or to ship it, and all of it is available. And also, as I talk about the database, uh, there was an additional question that asked about some insights about uh, technologies uh, disaggregated at, region, at the regional level. So all this information and actually the analysis that we have presented today uh, can be replicated uh, if you download the Excel database that are very comprehensive and have all this information. So all of this will be available in the Excel database that you can download at the IA website. And I have one last question for Uwe and it's it. We are keeping track of natural hydrogen. Yeah, I mean, um, just to be very brief, yeah, we also have a section on natural hydrogen in the report. And um, I mean, natural hydrogen, I guess, is, is also attracting a lot of attention these days. We see in many countries that um, that identified already um, resources or reserves for, for natural hydrogen. Um, I guess uh, it can be quite, pro it looks quite promising, but of course, at the same time, we also have to be um, more exploration work. We need to understand really what is the size of these individual, individual um, Kind of um, reservoirs that we have that that are that are there, and whether the size, let's say, is also large enough to justify an economic production in the end. So I guess at the moment we're still, I guess I would say, in the phase understanding better what is actually um, what's actually available, and also understanding, of course, then in the next step um, how it can be reused in the future. So I guess it's can be a quite promising area, but I guess we are still at a very early stage here um, to understand really what could be could be the impact um, in the end. So thank you very much for your questions. We are nearing uh, the end of our allocated time. Thank you very much for being with us today. If you have further questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and have a nice day.